on the topic of how in relationships there has to be give and take not just an imposition of authority and obedience so i'll talk based on the ramayana and we'll talk about the dynamic of the relationship between ram and lakshman so <clears throat> when these uh, in ayodhya maharaj dashrath had four sons does anyone know who were those four sons yes Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Good. So among these, two two formed a very close bonding. So who are the two who formed very close bonding? And thank you. And yeah, Ram and Lakshman and the other. Yes. Thank you. What of you? Excellent. So now, what happened is that. Ram was the oldest among all of them. So naturally, because of that little seniority, uh, because he was older, so he was respected. But even when he was respected, it is not that Ram always demanded obedience. See, in general, whenever we interact with each other, what happens is that we have a particular power dynamic in the relationship. Power dynamic means. Say maybe one person is more powerful, the other person is less powerful. Then the person is more powerful, that person can lay down the law. Say you have to obey me. But if a relationship is based only on that, that is imposing the law and obeying the law, then it's not a very sustainable relationship. What happens is that in such a, a, a dynamic, sooner or later. the relationship wears out so e this this is seen even in the animal kingdom now if we consider say just like children play games like animals also say when there are small rats small mice they also play games and ethology is a branch of science where it is the study of animals in their natural habitat so ethologists have found say for example if two mice two mice are playing and say one mouse is slightly bigger than the other mouse then if the two of them are playing rough and tumble you know who can push the other person down and dominate the other other mouse naturally if say one mouse is about 20 25% bigger than the other mouse the bigger mouse will naturally win but after some time even among <coughs> mice they have the understanding if the bigger mouse keeps winning constantly then the smaller mouse stops wanting to play and when one mouse is bigger than the other smaller and the other mouse is smaller then what happens whenever this the ex, whatever experiments have been done under lab laboratory settings the smaller mouse has to invite the bigger mouse to play because let's play and because then if the bigger mouse wants to play the bigger mouse is anyway going to win so the smaller mouse has to invite and if the smaller mouse refuses to play doesn't invite then they can't play so even among animals they've observed that the bigger mouse about 20 to 30% of the time the bigger mouse lets the smaller mouse win although by power the bigger mouse would win but why is that because otherwise the game would have no fun no fun for the smaller mouse so that's why even in the animal kingdom sometimes we say might is right but it is not always even in the animal kingdom might is not always right because if they live only on that power dynamic i am stronger and therefore i'll i will dominate you and i'll control you then that interaction cannot go on for a long time so similarly whenever there is a hierarchy say the like ram is the older brother lakshman is the younger brother so ram if ram gives an instruction lakshman will obey but that doesn't mean that all the times ram uses his position and dominates lakshman ram also listens to lakshman and sometimes there are times when lakshman also instructs ram so we'll talk about three different instances over here depending on how much time we have of how this relationship evolved 
So first instance is when <coughs> Ram, Lakshman and Sita were living in the Dandaka one, at that time they went into the, there was this magical deer who came over there. This deer was actually a demon. Does anyone know the name of the demon? Yeah, Ravan came also in disguise. But before that? Marichi. Yes, Marichi. Thank you. So both of them came in disguise. So both answers are correct. In this context, it is Marichi. So he came in what form? As a deer. Golden deer, yes. So when now he came, this deer came and started playing near the hermitage where Ram and Lakshman Sita were living. And then Sita said, Hey, this deer is so beautiful. Let's get this deer. He said, while I'm in this forest, there is this deer can be a pet for me. And it's such a beautiful deer that when we go back, I will give this deer as a memento, as a gift from the forest to Kaushalya. So uh, when they were all observing, Lakshman, see Ram, Lakshman and Sita all three were there and they all had their particular roles. Lakshman was more in the mood of uh, assistant and a servant. So he was very vigilant. So he says this deer looks very suspicious. This deer, something fishy about it. And normally if you see uh, if some dangerous animal is there, say if a tiger or a lion comes, then what happens? Other animals run away. Because that uh, is a predator, that's a danger. But a deer is not a danger for other animals. It's also one of the wild one of the animals in the wilderness. But Lakshman said, just see where this deer is playing, all the other birds and animals are running away from there. There's something suspicious. I think this is not a deer. This is actually some demon. In fact, this deer looks so suspicious that it doesn't it doesn't belong to the 8.4 million species. Something else is there over there. So then Sita said, hey, Lakshman, why are you so suspicious? This deer looks so beautiful. Let's go and get this deer. And she said to Ram, will you please get the deer for me? Now Ram thought at that time that Sita has sacrificed so much for me. Now she has left the kingdom and come with me to the forest. She was born in royalty. She has given up all that comfort. And she has never asked anything from me. So if she wants this deer, surely I should get this deer. So normally if some errand like this had to be run, Lakshman would have gone for it. But because Lakshman was a little suspicious, so then Ram did not force that point. Ram did not say, Lakshman, you go now. He did not say that. Ram said, okay, I will go. And he told Lakshman, you please guard Sita. So now, when this happened, then it went further and further. And this deer was just running. As soon as he saw Ram coming, it started fleeing. And while fleeing also, sometimes jump high up and disappear. Suddenly it would appear. Sometimes appear close by, sometimes appear far away. And as these magical kind of tricks started happening more and more, and Ram chased the deer deep into the forest. Ram finally realized there's something wrong with this deer. So he decided, he thought, even if it's a demon, still I'll catch it. And if it's a deer, it'll be attractive deer. And he thought, even if it's a demon, there's no danger for me. But then, when this deer started appearing and disappearing, and Ram went deep into the forest. So at that time, Ram said, that this, de this is a demon, this demon has tricked me and I will punish it. And then till then he had been chasing to catch. So he was not shooting arrows at the deer. One of the names of Ram is Amogasharam. When he hits a bow, his aim does not, he does not miss his target. So he shot an arrow, attack, that arrow went and hit the demon. Now, whenever demons, they change their forms. They have some mystical powers by which they can change their forms. So we have Putana. She had come in which form? As a, as, as a god, as a nurse, as a beautiful woman, maternal looking woman who would, uh, like a goddess, who would give nice milk as a nurse. So Ravan came in what form? As a sage. 
So normally what happens to hold on to these forms, to hold on to some mystical forms, some power is required. So they concentrate, they meditate, they utter some mantras and they use their mystic power to maintain that form. But when they are about to die, when they have been attacked, at that time they are losing all their power. So when they are losing all their power near death, that even the power to maintain that form is lost. And that's why we'll see most of these demons, if they're about to be killed, before they die, they come back to the original form. So Putana was an attractive looking nurse, but then suddenly, as Krishna was taking out her life fare with her breast milk, she became this scary, huge demon, demoness. So similarly, what happened? Maricha, this, this Didier from Amruga, he became Maricha. And then with his last strength, he called out. He called out, hey Sita, hey Lakshman. It was like a call for help. And he called out in the voice of Ram. And when Sita heard this, she, she begged and goaded and literally pushed with her harsh words, Lakshman to go there. Now when Lakshman went there, at that time, as soon as Ram realized this is a demon and he's calling out my name, he said, it's a, it's a trick. It's a conspiracy and he came running back. When he came running back, at that time, he <clears throat> met Lakshman who was running toward that direction. And he asked Lakshman, why did you leave Sita alone? And he said, you know, Sita spoke very harsh words to me. That's why she, I had to leave. So then Ram, at that time he spoke, you know, Sita, she must have been upset. Don't take her words so serious. You shouldn't have taken her words so seriously. And they, both of them turned and ran back. But by the time they reached the hermitage, Sita had already been abducted. Now at this point, it is important that what did Ram and Lakshman do? Now Ram was devastated. Lakshman was also very, very shocked. It's when things go wrong, it is very easy to start blaming each other. Lakshman could have said, See, I had told, there's no need to chase this. This is not a deer, it's a demon. He did not try to prove his point. You know. You know, there are four words which are very satisfying to the human ego. Hmm? That is, I had said so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if we tell someone, don't do something and then they do it, and then they get some trouble because of that. Now it's it's very obvious that they are in trouble. So if at that time I had said so, you know, it's like what happens? Not only they have made a mistake, they have made a mistake, and now we are catching their head and putting their face in the ground. So it's very easy either to blame the other person, and especially if some mistake has been made, then to blame is much more easier. But Ram Lakshman did not do this. I had said so. Why did you go after? It? Did not go after the deer. And although Ram initially spoke, and Lakshman, why did you take Sita's word so seriously? But he did not harp on that again and again. You now what has happened has happened. This, uh, life situations are such that even among those who are very close to each other, sometimes situations will come in such a way that something terrible will happen. And then what? There are three ways in which we look can look at it. One is broadly. I am right or you are right or what is right. So either I am right and I try to prove I am right or you are right. Then if the other person starts insisting I am right, then what happens? This first person feels dominated by that, feels humiliated by that. But not I am right, not you are right, but what is right. So now what is right? Sita is already lost. She's not there. The most important thing is not what went wrong. Okay, but what can we do now? So they all, both of them started searching for Sita. So throughout now when Ram and Lakshman are searching for Sita, there is no incidence of Ram and Lakshman quarreling among each other because of this. What happens is when somebody is a little bit too short tempered or demoniac, Generally, it is very easy to behave well in good situations when everything is comfortable. 
when things become uncomfortable then what happens that when things become difficult that's the time when how do we behave Prabhupada said one's greatness has to be seen by the capacity to tolerate provoking situations so the test of greatness is not what all great things we achieve but when provocations come how do we deal with them in the Chaitan Charitamra there is the story of two demoniac people Jagai and Madai now Jagai and Madai they were bullies of course bullies were the being a bully was you could say was the smallest of their wrong crimes <laughs> they are doing many other wrong things but they would like to catch some people and somebody and beat that person beat 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 and what would happen is if they don't have anybody to beat then they will start fighting with each other and beat each other because that fighting was urge was so much there that they had to fight with someone but Ram and Lakshman although they were Kshatriyas and they fought when it was required but they were not controlled by that and at this point the worst thing that they could have done is start quarreling with each other but they did not do that so when when some difficult situation has come you know either we can say that okay this difficulty is here and both of us are together trying to fight this difficulty or we let the difficulty come between us and then instead of fighting with the difficulty we start fighting with each other then after this as Ram and Ram was searching searching and he couldn't find Sita and in that despair in that agony Ram suddenly became angry and as he became angry he took his bow I turned around and says, oh trees tell me where is Sita he looked up at the sky oh gods you are witness to everything tell me where is Sita and when nobody replied Ram picked up his bow and he said if you don't tell me where Sita is I will use my mystic powers and I will destroy the whole world and when this happened immediately the whole atmosphere became agitated and the whatever birds animals they all shrank back in fear but at that time when Ram was getting angry like this Lakshmi immediately calmed Ram down he says oh Ram you you are the king you are the ideal human being yours is the example which everyone will follow now if you give in to anger amidst distress like this then everybody will do that he says I can understand your anger but let us first exert our fullest to try to find Sita and if you cannot find Sita then I will join you and we will act aggressive we will act aggressive we will give vent to our anger at that time so here in Ram of course is God and he is beyond all emotions all you could say mundane emotions but Ram is playing Narilila Narilila means acting as a human being and as a human being he demonstrates <coughs> to us various emotions which we may go through and how we deal with those emotions so to get angry it's when there is distress when there is great trouble now feeling upset, feeling angry, it's just a natural human emotion. Sometimes we think that being spiritual means that I should not have any non-spiritual or anti-spiritual emotions. This I was in America at one place, one devotee came to me and says, I have not told any of this to anyone, but I want to tell you this and I want to know whether it, what should I do? He says, what is it? He said that something had happened uh, in that devotee's life and they were saying that I am feeling so angry with Krishna and now because Krishna let this happen I am feeling angry with Krishna and I am scared that if I am angry with Krishna, Krishna will get angry with me and will Krishna punish me because I am angry with him <laughs> So I told him that actually God is big enough to accommodate even our anger you know, God God is very big so now what do I mean it doesn't mean that routinely we yell at God and we are angry with God not like that but the point is in any relationship there will be variety of emotions and 
If we see when Draupadi was attempted to be disrobed in the in the assembly in Hastinapur, at that time she called out to Krishna. Now, some, sometimes we say Krishna came and rescued her, and in, in movies or something in, in some movies you might see Krishna standing there with his hand upraised and the endless garment coming over there. But actually, there was no nobody saw Krishna over there. All that happened was that her garment was endless. And then people, everybody thought that because she's so pure and chaste, that's why her garment remained endless over there. But later on, when they went to the forest, and there Krishna came to meet her, meet them. And when Krishna came to meet, Draupadi broke down over there. She says, Krishna, I called to you. Why didn't you come to protect me? He says, I beg to you. He says, I am your, I am your relative, I am your friend, I am your devotee. You know, I deserve your protection. Why did you come? Now Krishna doesn't say over there, I am God, my plan is perfect. You are committing an aparad by challenging me. But Krishna doesn't go in that zone at all. Krishna takes a, almost like a human role and he says, I didn't know about the gambling match. He said, if I had known, I would have come and prevented the match itself. And he said, actually at that time, a demon Shalva had attacked Dwarka. And I had to rush there and I had to fight for a long time to uh, combat and crush that demon. And while Dwarka was being restored to normalcy, I heard that this has happened and immediately I came there. Oh, Draupadi, I've, I've heard about how you were faithful to Dharma. And you reminded everyone of Dharma even while facing such terrible other things. So this, your virtue will be praised forever. Those who have been wrong, those who have wronged you will be punished. So here, well, the point I'm making is that Krishna did not try to try to uh, did not challenge Draupadi's anger. Krishna consoled her. So similarly, here when Ram gets angry, uh, now, uh, Lakshman is not just like a uh, obedient servant. Oh, oh, you want to destroy the world? Let I also help you destroy the world. No, he calms Lakshman. He calms Ram down. So now Ram also doesn't get angry over there. Ram doesn't say, I am your older brother. Who are you to instruct me? <coughs> no, he, yeah, if what he's saying is making sense, then we have to accept that. So basically, for all of us, whatever be the relationship we are in, whatever be the hierarchy, the hierarchy is there. Okay, I am senior, you are junior. I am like this, you are like that. These are important things. But they are important for a purpose. And that purpose is to live, pro live virtuously, to practice dharma and ultimately to attain Krishna. So, once Prabhupada was in, America, Prabhupada was in Europe uh, and there was an initiation ceremony. And because the devotees, I think in the Netherlands or something, the devotees were very new. So everything in that initiation ceremony was messed up. So what happened, the devotees asked for, uh, Prabhupada said, get a banana. And they got a banana and then they peeled the banana and they made banana salad out of it. <laughs> then Prabhupada asked for flowers and then they made a flower garland out of it. And one after another, after things started going wrong. And Prabhupada became very angry. And now his anger is also understandable because this is a, this is a serious uh, ceremony and it has to be performed properly. But as he was getting angry and get this, get this, he, he was angry and he was scolding his disciples. At that time, a hippie came over there. And a hippie said, he had just come to see the ceremony and he said, Swamiji, don't get angry, just chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> And amazingly enough, Prabhupada looked at him, or picked up his beads, and Prabhupada chanted, started chanting Hare Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> now, what does it mean? This Prabhupada's anger was for Krishna's service. And that anger also is an expression of concern. But at that point, 
when even a person who doesn't know anything about chanting, he just heard, maybe he has heard only from Prabhupada, only chant Hare Krishna. And he's telling Prabhupada. Prabhupada did not take it as, how dare you instruct me. Prabhupada took that and he taught us by that. So these are Leelas. So Ram is beyond all anger. But when he comes in this world, he demonstrates how when we face the challenges of life in this world, how to go through those challenges. So, if we get angry, all of us, say if, if somebody might be a great heroic warrior, and they can fight and they can destroy legions of soldiers in the opposite rank. But if they become wounded, say their foot gets wounded, they might need some shoulder to lean on. That doesn't make them weak permanently, but at that time they are weak. So like that in our lives, sometimes we might just become weak. And when we become weak, if we always think that I am in a higher position, you are in a lower position, then we will not be able to function. So Ram took advice from Lakshman. Now further, if we go, and Ram and Lakshman, they, um, they met Sugriv, and then Sugriv was installed as the king. But after Sugri was installed as the king, then immediately Chatur Master, the rainy season started. Now at that time, normally we would say if somebody is lost, so Sita is lost, and why would you just, you just let some rain stop them from finding searching for Sita? No, it's a, somebody being lost is far more serious. In the rains also you can search. But that time what had happened because uh, Wali was the son of Indra and Wali had been killed. So Indra got very angry and the rain that Indra showered at that time was unprecedented and because of that even normal mobility became impossible and that's why four months during the rainy season they decided that we'll have to just stay here and every moment was agonizing for Ram because it's one thing if somebody whom we care for is in trouble and if you're doing something to help them then at least we have some solace, I am doing something. But if we, are, we can't do anything at all, then our mind starts driving us mad. So Ram was talking with Lakshman and he was talking about how Sita was so devoted and Sita was so good and Lakshman was hearing and they were together for those four months. You know, this was the time when they were, they actually came closer to each other than any other time. Because what happened, all the earlier times, Whenever they were together, there were always some other people. In the palace, they had so many other people. Earlier when they went to the forest, they had gone with Vishwamitra. So both of them were together, but they were always with Vishwamitra. And then, then beyond that, when they were in the forest, Rama and Lakshman were there, but Sita was also there. And then Rama was mostly Sita and Lakshman was serving. But here, Rama and Lakshman were alone together. Nobody else was there. And then Ram poured out his heart. And Lakshman consoled him as much as he could. So during this period, when Ram was weak, Lakshman, although he's the younger brother, he to some extent takes the role of the older brother. And he consoles Ram. Then after that, as the four months ended, and then Ram and Lakshman were waiting. And there was no sign from Sugri of anything happening. So, because there's nothing happening, Ram started getting first concerned, then annoyed, and then angered. And then he said, hey, Sugriv, you know, we did our part of the, of the deal. We helped him get back his kingdom and his wife. But he's supposed to help us, he's not helping us. He says, alas, he says, people in need, what happens is, they remember. Uh, when they are in need, they remember. See, wherever there is a will, what happens? Wherever there is a will, there are many willing relatives. <laughs> so, if somebody has an inheritance, then the relatives who may never have come, they all start coming and start asking for, how are you doing well? They hope something. <laughs> so, when we are in need, when we think we will get something, we are very eager to go there. But when we have to give something, we keep forgetting, we, we keep neglecting, postponing, forgetting. So he said, alas, this is human nature. And he says, the Sugriv, has he forgotten what we have done for him? 
without him how will we be able to find sita and if you can't find sita then why have we wasted so much time uh, so as ram got angry now although lakshman was playing the role of the older brother still what happens is each person has their own nature so when laksh ram got angry lakshman is a little more impulsive so lakshman got even more angry and he said yes i've been waiting for so long and is sugriv if he has forgotten he says i will go to ayo i will go to kishkinda <coughs> and i will punish uh, sugriv he says and if he doesn't listen i will destroy him and i will destroy his whole kingdom so ram said hey, cool down not so fast not so fast what happens sometimes that if somebody in a senior position they get angry then their anger can be taken by their juniors as a justification for their anger and sometimes the juniors express that anger in a far bigger way isn't it so yeah in a two three uh, in the daksha past time uh, we uh, basically when lord shiva was disrespected by daksha at that time his servants got very angry and they said how dare shiva be disrespected they started attacking and cursing the brahmanas who were there not just daksha but also the brahmanas and then we might say at one level it is justified you now for them it was their guru who has been offended and it's a guru apra how can they just passively hear it they should res- they should respond but the point is there may be particular rules that we should not hear the often attack or criticism of our spiritual master or our senior vaishnavas but the point of this is that we should act in a way that makes things better not makes things worse so yes we need to defend our spiritual master but defend in a way that makes things better if we defend in a way that starts making things worse that is you speak like this and i speak like that and then one harsh word and then 10 harsh words and then 100 harsh words and then it just escalates so here when as soon as lakshman said i said no i will destroy kishkind so we will ram said no 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 uh, don't do that he says we don't know what has happened but first go and inquire and restrain your anger restrain your anger give, find out what is happening and then if he is he is not ready to do his duty then we will decide what to do about it <coughs> so then when lakshman went there then he was angry and seeing sugriva uh, delighting in revelry in sensuality he got even more angry but then tara and hanuman calmed him and said actually while he has, uh, lakshman uh, sugriva had already summoned monkeys from various parts and they will soon come then i'll talk about one last incident and then we can have some inferences and question answers so when the war was going on there are various occasions in 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 the war that ram and lakshman fought together and basically indrajit wo indrajit kumbhakarna ravan these were the most three were the most formidable warriors on the uh, side of ravan and indrajit among them was the most cunning so indrajit once by attacking invisibly he attacked and felled both ram and lakshman but then uh, garuda came and he revived them then indrajit felled them again then hanuman went and got the mystical herbs with the hill then afterwards when indrajit was killed by lakshman ravan came to the battlefield again and that time ravan was furious and being furious and especially was angry at lakshman because when laksh you you killed my son and he used all his power to target lakshman and lakshman fought heroically he fought and fought and fought and so and it was a fierce battle that was just going on and on and on and finally ravan took a mystical weapon that he had got from the that he had stolen from the devtas 
and he shot that and now whenever these arrows would be shot the warriors would have three broad strategies one is counter the arrow attacking arrow with their own arrow second is you know use their own chariot or move aside so that they dodge the arrow or third is let the arrow hit them and if they have a good armor then the armor will withstand the arrow so ram lakshman was fighting and he saw this mystic missile coming he tried to counter with his arrows but nothing worked and then it went and pierced his chest and it created a hole in his chest and it went through him completely and lakshman just fell almost like dead and seeing this ravan immediately jumped down from his chariot he thought that if i can hold lakshman as hostage then i have sita already but you know he couldn't harm sita because he wanted sita but so i can threaten to kill lakshman and by that i can bargain with ram so he came forward and he immediately tried to pick up lakshman but what happened now lakshman is ananta shesh he is the person who holds all the universes and ravan was using first his two arms then he took his more arm then he has his 20 arms and he couldn't even move lakshman and as lakshman had fallen there was a shock you know the whole whole vanara army and hanuman had been fighting far away so hanuman saw that and he started charging towards ravan and he charged towards ravan and he, he roared loudly and ravan got distracted looked up at hanuman coming and before he could counter hanuman just bounded on him and hit him with both his fists on chest and ravan fell back and the blow was so forceful that you know ravan vomited blood from his mouth nose and ears <laughs> bah yes fell back and he was shaken and by the time he just recovered and he looked right in front of him hanuman put his two hands under lakshman picked him up and ran away <laughs> oh ravan was humiliated his first it's one thing that you can't even lift up your enemy and then somebody who is not even the top you are the top person in your army and somebody else is not even the top person in the army they beat you and they lift it in front of everyone and then by this time news reached ram and ram came over there so ram and ran back to his uh, chariot and from there started fighting and now ram was furious and ram shot a series of arrows and ravan he was so shocked by that that ravan moved away from there he retreated for the day and then ram turned towards lakshman and tears started coming from his eyes and that time ram said that oh lakshman he says he, he was touching ram lakshman he thought that lakshman is almost like dead he says oh lakshman he says yo he says your mother sumitra had entrusted me you to my care when i go back to yodhya what face will i show to her oh you know i may get he said i may i may get a wife like sita but i will never get a brother like you sita in one sense was obligated she the husband and wife are together she had an obligation to come with him but lakshman had no obligation to come with him he says you accepted so much discomfort and danger just for my sake and yet i could not protect you why only and he started crying and lamenting and as he was crying and lamenting at that time um, nala who was a nila and nala were brother the ashwini kumara's sons so they were the uh, they were like the physicians in the monkey army so they came and they said actually he still lives and then again the mystical herbs were used and he came back to life but the point over here is that ram acknowledges and knows the sacrifice that lakshman has performed so sometimes what happens when people are always with us we start taking them for granted see when what happens all of us it's very ironic that uh people with whom we don't interact much say we are walking on the road 
and somebody comes along on the way and they say sorry it's all right or is walking along the road and perfect strangers they say good morning how are you we are polite with complete strangers and then we come back home and with people who matter much more to us we are sullen and irritable and rude so now what happens here is that people who are always with us we start taking them for granted and then rather than in every relationship there is a contribution and there is a expectation that means what the other person is doing and what i am expecting from the other person so now both people have to have some contribution if there is only contribution from one side there is only expectation on the other side then the relationship becomes strained so when people are always there for us we can very easily take them for granted and it is only when we are threatened with losing them that's the time we may appreciate oh my god this person is so important for me this person is doing so much and we acknowledge the sacrifice we appreciate the sacrifice so it's important that we do so not only when we lose that person but when we even when they are there so although ram was the older brother and lakshman was the older younger brother ram did not think because i am older he is duty bound to do all this he saw nobody in a sense is is obliged to do anything for us we can say that there are duties and obligations but people may decide i won't do this duty and we can't how much can we force anyone to do anything so ram was conscious of all that lakshman had done and he was appreciative of that when lakshman came back to consciousness he says ram broke down and that says no lakshman if anything had happened to you i would not have been able to live everything in the world would have been useless for me without you he said that you, know, you are my life and soul and lakshman said please don't speak this you know we have to work together and get sita back we have to punish ravan so whenever uh, so lakshman ram although you could say the higher point in the hierarchy lakshman was lower point lakshman was younger but ram did not have a sense of entitlement you have to do this there was appreciation and that appreciation might be there in the heart but it needs to be expressed if we don't express the appreciation then what happens we uh, the other person is doing things but everybody gets discouraged in life this goes wrong that goes wrong that goes wrong and if we don't appreciate then people get discouraged so there's a famous british author he said that uh, <clears throat> i can run on one good compliment for 6 months so he's a author and he writes something and somebody one person appreciates that that gives me inspiration to go on for 6 months so actually just as the body needs food just as a car needs gas similarly the human heart needs encouragement and life will discourage us in many ways now there is a difference between encouragement and flattery flattery means that either that person does not have those qualities but we pre- we pretend that they have the qualities and main thing is that we are flattering so that we can get the other person to do something for us whereas appreciation is that what that person is doing we acknowledge that and we appreciate that so you know if we could just uh, even if we are in a senior position in a older position whatever if we learn to appreciate not just in our heart but also practically if we do that we will find that uh, the whatever inevitable strain and friction that comes in the relationships that will go down and we will be able to function much better many times when say some devotee departs from the world so i was at one such it's like a memorial meeting and the spiritual master of that community was also there so many devotees spoke very very glowing uh, homages to that particular devotee he was a very senior devotee or a very nice devotee who had departed from the world and then after that the spiritual master spoke and the spiritual master he told it was it was wonderful that all of you spoke such sweet words of appreciation but he said i want to know how many of you spoke these words while that devotee was alive 
Did he ever speak that? Way? Why should we delay appreciating others till after they die? So, if we just make it a habit, every day I will appreciate one person. Of course, you can appreciate more also. But even one person, if we decide, what will happen by that? Not only will create more warmth in the relationship, but also we will start looking for what good others are doing for us. Because it's very easy to find out what wrong others are doing. Because we have so many expectations and people don't do the right thing. Hey, this is not done well, this is not done well, this is not done well. And somehow there is a part of our ego which, which feels that I am so clever that I can find faults in others. You know, oh, you know, this person has not done this, this person has not done this. But actually in Kal Kaliuga is an ocean of faults. So in Kaliuga to find faults requires as much cleverness, as much smartness as is the smartness required say if we are lost in the ocean on a raft inside in the middle of an ocean to find water how much smartness is required that much smartness is required in the ocean water is everywhere <laughs> so yes sometimes we may have to correct others but if we learn to appreciate appreciate what others are going then that will act like a lubricant Inevitably, friction will occur. But if we have been appreciating each other regularly, that will be a lubricant. And if, if friction occurs, then the, the grinding and the eroding will not be that much. So, we see this through the dynamic of the relationship between Ram and Lakshman. That although they were brothers, although they were together, but even in their relationship, there were ups and downs. And they, all those ups and downs, because they were both virtuous, it brought all of them together more and more. So similarly, life, we will go through difficulties, but if we are devoted to Krishna and we are centered on that devotion, then the difficulties will bring us closer to each other, rather than tearing us apart from each other. So I'll summarize. I spoke on the topic of, of the dynamics of the relationship between Ram and Lakshman. So <clears throat> whenever there is any hierarchy in any relationship, the senior can expect, demand, expect or demand obedience and the junior may obey. But if that is the only basis of the relationship, it will not be sustainable. And although Ram was the older brother and he was the heir, still he did not demand obedience always from Lakshmi. So I talked about how in the animal kingdom also, my, it's not that it operates only on might. When mice are playing, a bigger mouse lets the smaller mouse win so that the smaller mouse will keep playing. And then we talked about four incidents from the Ramayana, uh, especially involving Rama and Lakshman. So Lakshman was cautious and suspicious about going after Maricha. Uh, but and his suspicion was proven to be right. But he did not, he did not tell Ram, see, I was right. That is a very satisfying thing for the human ego to say, I told you, I told so, I, have, I was right. So he did not indulge in that egoistic temptation. So instead of focusing on I am right or you are right, we focus on what is right. And then after that, when they were searching for Sita, at that time, Ra <coughs> Ram became so overwhelmed by agony and anger, he was about to destroy everything using his celestial weapons. At that time, although Lakshman was younger, Lakshman calmed him down. He said that. You are meant to set an example for others. If you give in to anger and destruction like this, what will other people do? And Ram did not become judgmental and say, yeah, who are you to tell me? So, uh, even Krishna, did. God is big enough. See, when the Lord comes in this world, he acts, to sh he may, as a Leela, he may go through various human emotions to teach us how we also need each other. And I talked about Draupadi and Krishna's relationship also that, that Krishna did not claim his godhood and crush Draupadi's protest. God is big enough to accommodate our anger also. If occasionally there is some, that kind of emotion arises. And the third incident I talked about was when, Wali, when Sugriv apparently was not keeping his promise. So Ram first became annoyed and then angered. And then Lakshman became even more angered. Sometimes those whom we love and respect, 
their displeasure we may use that as a justification for our disproportionate anger so we, lakshman said i'll destroy kishkinda but then lakshman ram calm lakshman down he's the first find out what is happening so yes we want to respect the honor of our seniors our spiritual master but we want to do it in a way that makes things better not worse and lastly i talked about how when lakshman was wounded by ravan's arrow at that time lakshma uh, ram broke down and he said he he acknowledged the profound sacrifices that lakshman had performed and he appreciated that so similarly uh, if we learn to appreciate each other regularly then that appreciation will act like a lubricant and whenever life's difficulties will put us will create some friction among us if there is the lubrication of regular appreciation then that friction will not cause too much destruction and we will be able to come through go through it and come closer to each other rather than be going further away from each other thank you very much hare krishna any questions or comments yes sir yes yeah the mic yeah. so often if we are working then we may have to keep a record of say i said so so that if something goes wrong then we don't get blamed for it so there are different contexts See, there is uh, there's a difference between taking responsibility and uh, passing on blame to someone else so it's not that if something has gone wrong we take the blame even when we are not wrong and it's not that we want to pass off the blame to everyone else but still if something has gone wrong we have to we have to find out what has gone wrong but the point here is that in that particular relationship we shouldn't demean the other person or make that other person feel so bad and discouraged that they quit so in a professional setting and in a devotional setting there is a significant difference in a professional setting even if uh, the boss chastises strongly hare krishna even if the boss chastises strongly it's okay no problem so because a salary is coming from the boss still we may tolerate but in spiritual life we are all volunteers and it is our own voluntary choice to practice bhakti so if we become too discouraged then we might just give up the practice of bhakti if we are even if somebody is wrong and we chastise them too strongly they may become so disheartened that they may give it up entirely so 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 we have to make sure that we don't dishearten people so much that they give up the practice of bhakti so if as you said in professional setting it's like they say i am here this person is here and this is the particular service so now if the service is not going through properly because of somebody doing something pointing that out is fine whether it is a professional setting or even a devotional setting but pointing out why something is not happening is very different from just pointing the finger at someone else See, even criticism can be done in different ways. If 
if see, there's a difference between making judgments and being judgmental making judgments is okay so if somebody is always forgetful then at that time if we have told them to do something important and then if they forget it is going to be a big problem for us then we have to make a judgment call that either i should i should tell that to someone else or maybe if i were to tell them that i had to repeat remind them repeatedly hey, please make sure that you know it please get it along so making judgments is fine but being judgmental is like affixing a label on the person and not only affixing the label on the person but seeing that person only through that label say for example say this is this is my phone but suppose this is a like a label this is like a opinion i have so if i i have found that somebody i work with and they have they don't do things on time or they forget or they they just don't do their words then if i fix the label this person is irresponsible this person is untrustworthy now from an operational point of view if i had to do something very important then i may not choose that person to do it so based on my past experience if i have learned something i can hold this hold this opinion close to me so that i am aware i can't forget but if i hold it like this so close to me that i can't see anything except the opinion that means as soon as we see a devotee we think irresponsible and incompetent untrustworthy cheater if that is all that we think about when we see that person then that is unhealthy so if based on our past experience we have learned some things about a particular person and we noted that down to make sure that we don't get unnecessarily blamed for it then pointing it out is fine but it is there's a different way to point you know say they we could say that you know because last time you did not do this service well so uh, we have decided to give the service to someone else that is objective still it is going to hurt a little bit but still it is objective because of this this but if i say because you are so irresponsible so we are not going to give any service Oh, irresponsible is it's like a value judgment it's not even we are not no, we are not even evaluating their actions we are like evaluating the person itself and that will be very alienating so i think we need to have a balance where we make sure that things get done and for that if we have to take a judgment call we have to do that but don't be so attached to the opinion that we reduce the person to that label and don't see anything apart from that label so is there any question okay so is is there any other question or should we stop yes sir we are in new kind of whole ramayana because you are talking most of the ramayana so in this it is been said that is a there is always a good relationship between ram and lakshman were there any instances where they because they both are human so were there any instances where they both had I'm not I'm not say any fight but then then and uh, was there any where there was the difference of opinions and how did they handle it oh of course many times <laughs> <laughs> where there difference of opinion between ram and lakshman yes two human beings when they interact with each other are going to be differences of opinion in america one of my friends is a uh, is a marriage counselor and he said i have seen there are only two kinds of couples <laughs> he says those who those who quarrel with each other and those whom you don't know very well <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> there are going to be differences if two living two people are going to be together it's going to be there so many places right from the beginning itself when ram is exiled in the forest ram says that ram accepts it as the will of destiny and he says i will go and lakshman says no he first cast blame at his father he says that or he doesn't even refer to him as, a, as our father he says dashrath the king has become maddened by lust for his youngest queen and that's why he has he has and to pander to her whims he subjecting you to this great punishment for no fault of yours and ram says no so i was with, with our father and i saw that he was getting no pleasure in this he was in great pain and he's not doing this 
because of pandering to him, he's out of obligation. He has a word of honor. So then he shifts his anger to Kai Kai, and Lakshman says that she, how selfish is she? That for her son's sake, she is sending you to the forest. So Ram pacifies her. He says, "Don't blame Kai Kai. He says, you know Kai Kai loved me just like she loved Bharat. Her love for me was like the flow of the Ganga." Lakshman is still angry. He says. That's what I can't understand. How did the Ganga dry up in one night? <laughs> and then he says that Ram replies that actually that's because that's why when I saw this happening, I understood this must be the will of destiny. So then Lakshman is still angry and he says it is only cowards who say that who call injustice as destiny and accept it. He says heroes fight against injustice. You should fight against this injustice. And then Ram says, "So my concern is, what is my duty? As a duty towards my father, I was ready to take up the kingdom. But now, as a duty towards my father, I will go for, go to the forest. So that was very serious difference of opinion that happened over there. But then eventually, Ram persuaded Lakshman. And as I said, the other incident, Ram was about to destroy out of anger." When he couldn't find Sita, that time Lakshman pacified Ram. So similarly, <coughs> when uh, eventually Ram decided to send Sita away, at that time Lakshman vehemently protested. He says, "What is her fault?" Even before that, when Sita was brought back and she had to go through the Agni Pariksha, Lakshman protested. He says, "No." So there were many times there were differences. Okay. Okay. So shall we stop here? So thank you very much, Shri Prabhupa. Okay, we have. Okay, one question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Prabhuji, uh, in the day, day-to-day life, you know, it's a general thing that um, I have seen or I have assumed this thing that doesn't matter that how long you've been into devotional service, you are doing everything in the Krishna consciousness. You are calling everything to be just a part of it. You're doing chanting and everything, but still there are situations comes where you lose your temper and you get really, really angry. Even the matter is not that big, but still mm-hmm. you get, you know, aggressive and you criticize the other person. And uh, you know, you just say what you're not supposed to say. You know, so how and what you reckon that one can do to, to come out of this? Because this is actually a very basic thing that okay. we actually deal with on day to day. Yeah. See, if despite practicing bhakti, we still get angry, uh, then what do we do at that time? The three broad things. First is that we have to learn to understand ourselves. If somebody had been very short-tempered earlier, then what may happen is we may practice bhakti, but that anger may not go away immediately. It may re- immediately it may require some time. So. If we understand that, okay, I have a tendency to get angry, then best is to try to anticipate and avoid provoking situations in advance. That means, okay, in this situation, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get angry. So better avoid the situation. So it's like we can't always avoid, but it's like say if we are driving on a road and you know there is a pothole over there. Then first time we might be jolted by the pothole, but second time we are careful with drivers. So if we know that there is a particular person with whom dealing with them is very difficult, then there are some people who bring happiness wherever they go, and there are some people who bring happiness whenever they go. <laughs> so there are difficult people in our lives. Now it may be that we are just that they are difficult in general, or just we have difficulty in dealing with them, or whatever it is. But if we know that we have five, six, ten difficult things we have already gone through, and we are nearing our breaking point and at that time we interact with them it's almost sure that we will break down so we can try as much as possible to anticipate and avoid provoking situations if we know that we are going to get provoked second is that uh, it's it's be- to make a resolution like I will never get angry that is a resolution that has no success only failure because <laughs> what happens I may succeed for 365 days and in 366 days when I get angry, I feel oh it's all useless. So instead of that, what you could do is 
try to change the resolution to a more positive focus. What is that positive focus? You could say that you now I will I will respect everyone's right to be spoken to politely. I will respect everyone's right to be spoken to politely. It's like I when I make mistakes, and I, I wouldn't like it if somebody yells at me. So I'm still a human being and I deserve to be spoken to politely. So when you think of it from the other person's if you think of it simply in terms of our self-control, it seems like a losing battle. But if you think of it from the other person's perspective, then what happens is it, it creates a little more empathy. And even if we speak one word, one word impolitely, one word angrily, one sentence, two sentences, but as soon as we realize, oh, okay, I should maybe then I will apologize after that. I will clarify. I will calm down. So try to think not so much in terms of I and my anger as the effect of that anger on the other person. And then I will respect everyone's right to be spoken to politely. If you have that perspective, then even if you speak impolitely, you will come back towards politeness. And third thing we could do is try to find out our own pause button for ourselves. Pause button means when our emotion comes upon us, we can't repress it. If you repress it, what will happen is anger will stay inside, anger will get solidified and then it will become hatred. And that's very unhealthy. But if you just, uh, that anger repressed inside will burn us, anger expressed outside will burn the other person. So what do we do? We pause and then we process. Pause means, so we don't express, we don't repress, we process. And processing requires us to pause. So pause means you try to find out something which can, something maybe devotional, which you can di to which you can divert your consciousness. Maybe if you like to hear some kirtans, have a picture of your spiritual master, or have a picture of your favorite deities, uh, darshan or whatever. And whenever you feel angry, and anger rising, try to direct your thoughts towards that. So, so what we are trying to do by that is, anger is coming like a wave. And it is threatening to sweep us away. And if you try to fight the wave, it's very difficult. But if you hold on to an anchor, and that anchor, although the wave will come and wave will hit, but you can hold on. Holding on to the anchor is easier than resisting the wave. So try to find out which anchor works for you. So and once you find that, okay, you hold on to that, that's like a pause button. I'll pause. Not that I'm denying. I am feeling angry right now and I cannot just wish away the anger. But I don't have to immediately give in to it. Calm down and then once you calm down, then think a little bit about it. Okay, what exactly made me angry? And how can I express myself in a way that leads to the, that solves the issue rather than complicates the issue? I try to follow a 24 hour rule. What does mean is that sometimes, I, because I travel so much, I correspond with people on emails or messages or whatever and sometimes people do such things make me so angry so when I'm angry I may write a very angry email but for 24 hours I will not post that email and in those 24 hours sometimes that other person only writes and clarifies something I realize there's no need for me to get angry or sometimes they apologize or after 24 hours I realize this is not such a big issue or if I still feel it's a big issue then I can reread the email and then we soften some words and then almost I never if I waited for 24 hours I have sent the email as it is I always soften the email and not that every time the issue has been resolved but at least I can say that the issue has not got aggra aggravated so we could do these three things basically <coughs> learn to avoid provoking situations and see from the other person's perspective and try to speak in a way that you respect their right to be to, to be spoken to politely and then find your own pause button so that you can process the emotion and act properly. Does that answer your question? Yes. Um, if there is a situation where one person is criticizing you or yelling you in front of other people whom you know, then how that other person has to react from that situation? Okay, if somebody is criticizing us publicly, what do we do? Yeah, it's a difficult situation. See, in general, in cultured societies, uh, confrontations are dealt with privately. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> say even if some 
if parents have some issue and they want to quarrel. Now parents will not quarrel in front of their children. <coughs> now they will usually, they will maybe go in a private room or go somewhere and then they will deal with their issues. So because why bring it out in front of the children? So generally in front of, pub, in public, it's best if we can avoid that and we can develop that as a culture. But if somebody is just doing that in public, it is best that we avoid escalating the conflict in public. Now, how do you do that? That depends. Broadly speaking, we have three options. You know, confront them, confront them, not in a counter accusation, but confront by telling the facts. Or we clarify to others, maybe when they are there or some other time, or we just neglect. Because if somebody is going to that extent of yelling in public, we may feel I am losing face because this person is accusing this, me of this. But actually, people are also intelligent. If somebody is yelling like this in public, then, then people also, you know, that person is also losing credibility. This is not the way to behave and people understand this. See, what we speak about others also speaks about us. What we speak about others, it also speaks about us. So we might feel, oh, what will people think about me if this person is speaking like this? But yes, that's true and ideally it should not happen. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't get, we shouldn't get too insecure because of that. Because in the world, people may accuse and uh, that accusation will stay for some time. And then these kind of things don't last for very long. Now, those who those who want those who delight in gossip they may remember it and they may circulate it also but only for some time till they find a new gossip to come up <laughs> so uh, these things will if something like this happening best is at that time we focus on not escalating it sometimes if like they are making some accusation and we give some statement some facts we just like deflate the whole thing that might help sometimes we just walk away from there sometimes we give a fact-based clarification. So how to do it? So we either address that person or we address others at appropriate forum or we just neglect the whole thing. We find out what works the best. Okay. So thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada ki. Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki. Itai Gaur Premanande. Jai.